Hello everyone and welcome along to the fourth and final edition of our preview of the four Super Rugby Conferences for 2016. Now, if you've been following the series, you'll know that we've already looked at the Australasian group with their two conferences. Now we're in the South African group and we've already looked at South Africa 1. Now it is time for Africa 2. We have four teams coming your way. The Jaguars from Argentina, the Kings, the Lions and the Sharks from South Africa. We're going to dig straight into it. Have a look at who I think is going to be their key players, their strengths, their weaknesses, their transfers, all that sort of goodness. And of course, where I think they'll finish after the regular season. So let's not piss about. Let's get straight into the action and have a look at our first team, which will be the Jaguars from Argentina. Argentina as a country has really grown on me over the last probably two to three years. I didn't really know much about them a while ago, three, four years ago, say, before I really started to do these videos, I didn't know a huge amount outside New Zealand. I've learned a hell of a lot about these other countries, and Argentina has really grown to be a part of me, and I do love this team. I do love how they play, and I really enjoy watching a lot of their players. So to see them have a Super Rugby side is just so exciting because these guys are good and they're only going to get better it may of course hurt them my beloved all blacks one day but it's great to see international rugby coming strong and really from my perspective more of a neutral fan these days and argentina the jaguars let's have a look at their team because well it's pretty much their international side we'll start things off with the front row and there's three names here that you all should be pretty familiar with if you're into international rugby. Herrera, Paz and Shaparo. Three extraordinary props that could really lead this team forward. Of course, there's a lot of years left in them. They're really establishing themselves internationally over the last year in the Rugby World Cup. And now they have another chance to show on the world stage at the highest level what they can do. I think the front row straight away is good. And then you look at the hookers. Augustine Cleavy. What a pickup to get him in this Jaguars team. And of course, Julian Montoya. Just fantastic to have both of those pretty much straight out of Argentina, straight out of the World Cup into the Jaguars. Okay, so the front row looks fantastic for the Jaguars. What about the second row? Well, it gets even better. Alimano, Juan Cruz, Guilliman, and Lavanini, and Pitti. That is for internationally known second rowers. Picking them up from all over the place as well. Rousing Mitchell Mitro and Stade Francais as well. Just having to let these guys go because they want to be part of this Jaguars team. I mean, that's a really good looking second row as well. Again, international experience is going to be their strength. Into the back row. And there's, there's just players you know all through here because they're all key because Argentina has developed a very even, very flush looking development system. We have Baz, Issa, Leguzaman, Lazana, Matera, and Desio. What an outstanding flanker group that is. And of course, Leonardo Senatore as well, backing up as the number eight from the Worcester Warriors as well. No one can keep hold of these Argentinians. Just, you know, playing their trade everywhere. Now, they can all play together. They can all play professionally, which is huge because the Argentinian Domestic League is not professional. It is amateur. Now, these guys can stay at home, kind of, traveling the world at the same time, but they can play super rugby like the All Blacks, like the Wallabies, like the Springboks, and they can play at the highest club level. They can play at home and together, which is massive for Argentinian rugby all over. Now into the backs, and they just have one scrum half listed with Martin Ladajo, the only one there. Very, very good, but they'll be disappointed they couldn't grasp on to Cabelli, who has gone to the Brumbies. That could be a weakness if they don't find a backup for him. I'm sure they'll get someone there if something goes wrong, but they need someone else to cover in there, I'm sure that someone will find the room in the back line to cover from scrum half. But Landajo, out and out, he is a very good player, but he can't play every minute of every game. As, of course, Graham Henry famously said, scrum halves can't play 80 minutes, but we've seen it done before, so who do you believe? Outside him is going to be the fly halves, of course, and Santiago Gonzalez Iglesias, Juan Martin Hernandez, and Nicolas Sanchez. What else?
else can you say? They've stolen two fly halves from Toulon. That's how good they are. They play for Toulon. Arguably one of the most successful recent clubs as well. Juan Martin Hernandez, Nicolas Sanchez, they're going to be huge. I mean, Hernandez can play in the centers as well. Fullback, he's a very versatile player and a very, very good player as well. The centers now is going to be a big part of their game. Their backline really has improved recently, and they've picked up Ascarate, Buffelli, De La Fronte, Moroni, and Orlando. Big names, especially the likes of De La Fronte and Moroni. They're established, of course, international players as well, and they know how to play top-level rugby. They will be a massive asset for this Jaguars side. On to the outside backs. And there's possibly one of my favorite players going around the scene at the moment, Santiago Cordero. This man is just so good in 2015. He was a joy to watch, an absolute stunning player to watch as well. To get him playing with his Argentinian teammates at such a young age on the grand stage of Super Rugby, it is only going to be great things for Cordero. And of course, Montero outside of him, and Moyano coming in as well, the third winger, with none other than Jacqueline Tuchelet, the fullback, coming in from the Cardiff Blues. I mean, they've really stolen players from absolutely everywhere, and they've picked up the Argentinian assistant coach, Perez, as well. It doesn't get much better than this for the Jaguars. I think they've got an amazing team. They've pretty much plucked their international side and put them in a Super Rugby team. I mean... Sure, Japan has done similar as well, but Argentina is just already just about peaking to be a tier one nation. Or surely, no, surely they are now a good tier one nation. They can challenge South Africa, they can challenge Australia, and they can challenge the All Blacks as well. Fourth at the Rugby World Cup, you can't take that away from them. Okay, so where do I think they're going to have their strengths and their weaknesses? It is hard to say. We know how Argentina plays. But how will the Jaguars play? Of course, it helps them that they're pretty much all international players coming straight out of Argentina. They're playing professionally and they're playing in their own country. That has to help them. Fourth place in the World Cup. Now you go to Super Rugby. They have to transfer that fantastic form. They have to learn to play the exciting Super Rugby style of rugby as well. They have to use their backs. They have to use the players that entertain. The Corderos, the De La Fuentes, the Maronis, who can break a game up. Tukalet as well. Another one who can just spark nothing into something brilliant. What we don't know about them has to be their weakness. Can they hack it at Super Rugby level? It's a different game to an international's. But it's just the way the game is played. The the cutthroatness of how teams will just do the unbelievable. There, there's not test match glory. There's no World Cups on the line. And teams will throw that 50-50 pass that will win or lose a match. Can the Jaguars adapt to that? Will they learn that style of play? I think they're good enough. This is a talented bunch of players. One positional weakness, I think, will be at scrum half. With only Landaho listed there, um, they need to pick someone else in there. They need to have a backup for Landaho. That could be an area of concern for the Jaguars. But all in all, my final thoughts on the Jaguars, number one, they're going to top this pool. And it's a very, very strong pool as well. But they're not the only ones coming into this competition with the element of the unknown. Coming in also, the second new team into this conference will be the Southern Kings. Now, of course, Super Rugby hasn't been too kind to the Southern Kings. They spent one season a couple of years ago and found, well, they found it very tough. Let's be completely fair. And it comes probably to no surprise that many expect it to be a replay of that season. So let's have a look at their team and see if we can really pick out who will be a standout for this King side. We'll start off their props. You've just got three listed here, but it has to be Andre Ants who's going to be the key man, the man from Montpellier coming in alongside him, uh, Tim Boffer and Scott Ferreira. They have to be, you know, big pressure on those three because that's only three props named two of them a match. Where's the other sub going to come from? There must be more to the Kings having struggled r- really to name a big, decent squad. Into the hookers and they've picked up a hooker from the Cheetahs and Martin Benzudenhout. He's going to be key for them. Super Rugby experience is massive. Also, Martin Ferreira and Edgar Marutuli coming for the third hooker spot. 
They've picked up a lot of second rowers as well, all mostly from the Eastern Province Kings side from the Curry Cup, and we'll have a look at how that Curry Cup side went at the end of the squad, but it's going to come down to the names that come in with experience at the top level. Philip Dupreer will be the one from Bane that comes in, but also Stephen Sykes has got to be one. He's captaining this team, and he has to lead from the front. Others in the team, Astle, Frizzani, Hiss, Olafussi, and Tyler Paul. Most of them domestic players for the Kings in the Curry Cup. The back row is made up again from pretty much Curry Cup players with Bowley, Kloiti, Williamsy, Villeman, Davis, Engelbrecht, and Pukamila, the named players in the back row. You know, can these players step up from Curry Cup? Because the Kings didn't perform very well, let's be fair, in the Curry Cup in 2000. And 15. Can they step it up now? Can they live to Super Rugby level? It is a big step up from Curry Cup and to have everyone coming from a similar level, everyone having to step up. It is a tough call, especially when you have other teams that are so strong in the back row. These guys could well struggle. Just two scrum halves have been listed here for the Kings James Hall and Kevin Luters, the two names, and they're going to have a lot of pressure on them. Again, local league player, players from the Kings. Stepping up to Super Rugby level. Outside of them, a fly half is a couple of names that do have Super Rugby experience. Louis Flock and Alga Watts will be the ones that need to lead this back line. Boy, oh boy, they have a lot of pressure. Shane Gates as well is the third name, but where are they going to get this from? It's a huge job for those two to lift this team up another level. They're the ones that kind of use their experience in that important role of fly half. The centers, there is three named here. Stefan Wodemeyer will be the key one for them. He has to step up and lead with his number 10s inside him as fly halves. Those two need to combine very well. Duplessis and Arm will be the other two in the squad. It's a lot of pressure here for these players. Gray and Vulindlu will be the two named wingers with Axtein. Jaya and Jürgen Visser, the fullbacks and wingers. Now, Visser has to be very important. Coming in from the Bulls, he again is experienced and he needs to lead this team solid from the back. He needs to inject himself and show, you know, how the Super Rugby level is played. These guys will know it, but it's different when you get out there on the pitch. The Kings have a lot to prove here. I'm concerned. I'm, I'm very concerned at how many of these guys can make the step up. This is a very, very, very inexperienced side at Super Rugby level. Of course, you've got to start from somewhere. And I credit them for recruiting 90% locally from the EP Kings. But are they going to have that same impact? Can they lift up to Super Rugby level? And this very tough pool as well. You know, the Jaguars are a very good team, but the Lions and the Sharks also in this conference. It's going to be tough for the Kings. I'm picking them to come fourth. It pains me to say it. I'd like to see, you know, some new big names come out of this Kings team. But based on their Curry Cup form, where they were very poor, finishing second to last as well, it's not looking too good. Um, the front row, uh, surely there's a lot that they could learn. Some decent established kind of players at Curry Cup level as well that will look to bind this forward pack which could show some potential they've got more ability they've got more experience would be a better word than the back line that is for sure um, the experience of fly half has to be important for them as well but will these players step up can they get a squad performance or will there be just a few standouts leading the Kings through the season Okay, so we make our way from the Kings and into a team we all know all about, the Lions. Now, the Lions were brilliant in 2015. Easily their best season, finally breaking the shackles of being those easy beat South Africans. They're back, and they are back looking very, very good as well. Let's take a look at their team and the changes they've made. Just one going out from the group of props. That is Scott van der Merwe making his way off to Montpellier, which is a bit of a loss, but I think they should be all right there. Julian Riddlinghays will be a big, important player for them, and Van Julian as well, with Free and Dwyer, the other two named there. In the middle of those will be the hookers, of course. Mark Petroius, 
out of the team. They still have Robbie Kutzia, Malcolm Marks, and Vandermeer as well in the team. Echo Vandermeer, that one is. Into the second row, and this is where they start to build to their strengths. They have lost JP Dupree, of course, and Andreas Vera going back to the Curry Cup side, but they've picked up from the Golden Lions, also the Curry Cup side, is Lawrence Erasmus. Now, they've got a pretty decent second row. Franco Mozart will be a key for them. Robert Kruger and Martin Muller will be the other ones in the team for the second row. But this is where they're strong right now. It's in the back row. Big names, Jako Krill, Derek Minnie, Warwick Tecklenburg, and Warren Wrightley. Four big game players. I mean, they had the best back row, no question about it, in 2015. They've got them back, and they're going to do the same job. Warren Tecklenburg, nicknamed Warren Tackleberg in the last season's Super Rugby competition. Warwick Tecklenburg, of course, nicknamed last season Warwick Tecklenburg. He was just that good. He, an absolute menace on defence alongside Jakob Krell, Derek Mini, Whiteley. You know, these were players that people were calling to be in the Springboks team for the Rugby World Cup. Could have things be different? Should they have been there? We will never, never know. But surely another season like last year will definitely put their claim to higher honours in the lights. Moving into the scrum halves, and then we get another man who was, well, highly called for to be part of the Springboks side. Fafta Clark is leading the way for the scrum halves. Ross Cronier and Ricky Schroeder as well, the three scrum halves named. Schroeder coming in from the Lions Carry Cup side, but Fafta Clark, I think, is a real talent, and they've done a good job keeping him there because outside him, they have two very, very good fly halves and Boshoff and Yantes. Very good number 10s. I think they're well covered in that department. Jakob Underbold as well will line up as the number 3 in the number 10 jumper. Into the centres and we have just one retirement. Alan Hollenbach making his way to retirement. Hope the best of things for him. But the name centres, there is a couple of big ones here. Uh, Mapoi and Minissi are going to be key names for this Lions team. Of course, Harold Vorstad as well. He's got plenty of talent, but the wingers are where it really comes to play. Main Street, Skosan and Volming are definite game winners with real X-Factor ability on the fullbacks as well. J.W. Bell coming into the team. He'll partner it outside Ruan Combrink. And Andres Kudzia, a good-looking Lions team, I think. They're quite nice, uh, built side. It's got key players where you want them to be. It's got a very good back row. It's got decent second row coverage as well. But it's going to be what that back row does. The likes of Creel Mini, Tecklenburg, Whiteley, and then the Fafta Clark, and the Yantis of Boshoff, alongside Mapoi and the Skosans in that outside. I think this Lions team could really go very well, like we knew last season. Young, talented, and punched far beyond what everyone expected. It's tough to say this, but I still think they're going to finish third in this pool. I think they've got a very good side. Worthy if it was an everyone play everyone onto one group pool table, was everyone was on the same table. I think the Lions would definitely be in a chance for a top eight finish. But the way this format works and the pool that they have grouped into, I think it's going to be very tough for the Lions. If they went into Africa 1, I would probably pick them to finish first or second alongside the Stormers. They've got very, very good sides. But here, I just think it just won't be quite enough against some really good all-round sides. Like the next one, we're going to have a look at the Sharks. Uh, their back row got to be their strength. But where they may find find themselves wanting will be their back line. A lot of players still developing very much so, like the centers and the wingers. They need the likes of Skosan and Volmink. Were very good in pass last season, but they need that consistency and they need that experience as well. Will they find it? They, this could be the year, as we've said many times already, but that could be an area that teams could target and look to exploit. But if they step up to the mark, it could be an area of strength for the Lions because we know all too well how good these guys can be. We have just one team remaining, just one team, and we will have looked at all 18 super rugby sides. It has been an absolute pleasure to look at these teams. I have 
already learned so much about how these teams may well operate just by the names of players, where players have gone, where they'll come in. One team to go, it is the Sharks. And this is, I think, a very, very good Sharks team. I think they could go very well to pushing the top of the table if they get things clicking very quickly. Let's have a look at who they've got in their front row. There's a few big names here in the prop section for the Sharks. Of course, who they've lost, Yanni Dupsi, off to Montpellier, Matt Stevens away to Toulon. But they've picked up Cornelius Tanazin from the Cheetahs. Alongside him is the big man in Tamarera. And of course, Dal Chadwick will be another one who is definitely capable of playing at this top level. In the middle of those guys will be the hookers. And they've picked up, I think, a very, very good transfer. And Chili Boy Ralapelli, who's going to be massive, I think, for the Sharks. Of course, they've lost Bismarck Dupassi. Way to Montpellier, but what a way to replace him with Ralapelli. And I think there's no question that he will lead the charge from the middle of the front row. And that's that's very good front row with him, Tal Rera, Ralapelli, and then Usanazen or Chadwick in there as well. Uh, Adrian's as well in the middle of that mix. A chance for a very good rookie front row. Plenty of depth off the bench for the Sharks. It's a good place to start for their team. Into the second row, and they've lost a couple of players. Most notably is Peter Steph to Toit, making his way, of course, to the Stormers, and Botha away to the Newcastle Falcons. But they picked up Rob Botha from the Stormers and David McDooling from the Reds. Now, how will he adapt to Sharks rugby will be interesting, but there is some talent left there, but possibly this is the area that they'll struggle the most in the second row. The back row has been somewhere the Sharks have been quite strong for a number of years, and They've lost a couple of key players. Willem Alberts is off the start front, say. And Ryan Kankowski, I think, a really good player, very underrated player, is off to play for the South African seven side. He is chasing Olympic gold, which is a shame for Super Rugby, but I do wish him all the best. Kankowski, a brilliant, brilliant player. I think he will really excel in the sevens game. What they have done, though, is picked up some exceptional replacements. Keegan Daniel coming back to the Sharks. Sharks Bogita coming in from the Waratahs. And Philip van der Volt coming back from France to the Sharks as well. Alongside him, they have, of course, Marcel Cotzea, uh, Jean Dysel as well. Plenty of big names in that back row that could prove to be a strength. Bogita was fantastic, I think, last season for the Waratahs. All really strengthened this back row for the Sharks and they have a very good looking forward pack maybe a bit of question mark over their second row. Into the back line and we look at the scrum halves and they have lost Cameron Wright who is off to Montpellier as well but they have of course Corbett Reynard is will be the will, will be the front runner for that number nine jumper Michael Classens as well Conrad Hoffman and Stefan Angura. Pretty good depth there for the scrum halves for the Sharks as well but it's outside them I think they may have missed a trick here. They've released a couple of players out. Fritz Alinga going to the Cheetahs. And they've let go Linnell Cronier as well, which could prove a bit of a problem because they have just one named fly half, which is Patrick Lambie. But they've picked up Joe Peterson from the Cheetahs. Is that somewhere where he may slot back in to that number 10 jumper to fill a hole while Lambie is out? I think that's going to be a big loss for the Sharks as well so early in the season to lose a player who I think uh, improved a lot over his limited chances in 2015. The centers have had a couple of departures. Francois Stein, the biggest one, leaving to Montpellier. But they've picked up Paul Jordan coming in from the Curry Cup side. Paul Jordan, I think, a very, very good player. And I'm surprised, you know, he hasn't been a more consistent feature for the Sharks. He'll partner Williams and Mr. Hazen as well. But all in all, not the strongest looking centre pairing. Waylon Murray, another one who has been uh, left out of that centre's group. But there's plenty of men here in the wing and fullback department that could fill that centre's pairing up. They have a well, of course, release Paul Perez, which I think is a bit of a shame. I think is a real standout for Samoa in recent years. But we look at the ones that they already have here, the likes of Mbolvo, uh, Indangani, JP Peterson, and Satoli. They are real match winners. They are electrifying players. And then, of course, Fili LaRue coming in from the Cheetahs. SP Marius making his way out to the Kings. So 
plenty of changes here for the Sharks, but I think they have definitely strength on their side. A very, very tough pull as well that they have found themselves in in Africa too, alongside the Jaguars, the Kings and the Lions. I think the Sharks will finish second, a close second, possibly even first, but I'm going to nudge it to the Jaguars, give the Sharks second. I think their strengths will be their outside backs, like I just spoke of. Involvo, Indigani, Peterson, Satoli, LaRue and Joe Peterson as well. And in the front row, where they have a real strength of the likes of Mtarawera, Urston Hayes and Andreans, and of course, Rala Pelli coming in to the middle of the hooker as well. That's got to be the strength of the Sharks. Where they may get found out is their depth at number 10 or the shift arounds that they're going to have to make with the injury to Patrick Lambie. Could well hurt the Sharks' side early on in the season. And we know that a bad start can lead to the end of your season before it's even really begun. But the Sharks look good, and I think they could be in the front running to top the pool. If not, they could be right up there as that one qualifier from the best placed rest of those two conferences together. But that is it. That is a look at all 18 sides in the 2016 Super Rugby season. There is an absolute plethora of talent here, and a pile of great players, some amazing teams. There's some real concerns. There's some excitement as well for what some teams can or cannot do. It's going to be a brilliant season. The format, of course, if you're confused how it works, check out my video I made just a few days ago about how the format will work for 2016. See where your team will be, who they'll be playing, who they'll be up against, where they need to finish to make it into playoffs. And it is just a few days away now, even till the season starts. So the excitement is going good. I hope to see plenty of you up and about for these matches. Get in touch with me on Twitter. Let me know what your thoughts are, of course, on Twitter and in the comments below at Cornflakes Crib. You can catch me there. We'll be more than happy to have a yarn with all of you about these games going on, as always. But for now, that is my time done and dusted. That is all 18 sides from Super Rugby 2016. I'll be back again for plenty more about Super Rugby over the next few months as well as a Super Rugby series coming your way on Rugby Challenge 2. So stick around for those. Plenty of action coming your way. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. If you've enjoyed these or you'd like to see more of these looking at squads and predictions for the matches, reviews and previews, let me know in the comments. Give the video a thumbs up if you'd like to see more of these kinds of things as well. And it's good to know what you guys actually like to watch. And I can make that kind of content for you guys more often. So thank you all for watching and tuning in. I hope you're enjoying. And until next time, take care.